thank you all very much for coming. Um, so the topic for today is New Zealand's uh, foreign affairs. Um, and then I put the subtitle priorities and challenges. I just want to, first of all, thank the Honourable Nanaya uh, Mahuta for agreeing to come today. Uh, it's a it's an honour to have her here. And I know that she's had a really busy, very busy agenda traveling overseas. And I think we're really fortunate to have her here when she's just come back from the UN. Uh, and I just want to remark on her speech at the UN. For those of you who have seen it, um, I think it's uh, a remarkable speech. And for those of you who haven't, um, I recommend you go and find it on online when you go home. It's a great speech. And um, I was really proud to see you speaking. And um, I started crying when you broke into song at the end. I found that very emotional, actually, and seeing all the New Zealand contingent stand up and sing uh, Te Araha with you. So very special. And we're very honored to have you here today. And thank you very much for agreeing to come. Um, thank you also to the other speakers who are going to speak today. For me, I also have a connection with this um, piece of land uh, and a connection with Al and Claire in particular. So um, I did my LLM up here and um, I did my PhD. I was had a little study a room in Kopuroa. So I spent quite a few years under stress and um, hiding from Al and Claire sometimes. Al was my chief supervisor on my PhD and Claire was also on my supervisory panel with Margaret Bedgood making up the, um, the Trinity. And uh, yes, it was a memorable <laughs> time. And so Al and Claire have been with me. I've known them for 20, about 23 years actually. So it's actually a coming home for me too. Kopuroa doesn't stand here anymore, but the law school was actually on the site where the PA is now. And so you're also coming home to your place where you started out mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to say that this is a really special time for me. And I'm really grateful that um, Nanaya made time for this in her schedule. So how we're going to proceed is um, I'm going to hand over, but we have three speakers from uh, Te Piringa, the Faculty of Law, which used to be here and it's now in the fancy building across the road. Uh, so we have uh, Leilani Tuala Warren, uh, Claire Breen and Al Gillespie. So um, they're all professors uh, in the law school. Um, and I will introduce them one by one and say a few words about them before they speak. They've got about five minutes to make a few remarks and maybe end with a question for the minister. And then after that, um, we're going to hear from uh, Nanaya Mahuta. Now, of course, she's here today, not in her ministerial capacity, but as the Labour spokesperson on foreign affairs. So I'll just you know, make that clear that she's here supporting me in my campaign as the spokesperson mm -hmm. on foreign affairs today. But uh, she will then speak for as long as she wishes. Um, and then we'll have some questions to wrap up uh, at the end. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Professor Leilani Tuala Warren, who joined the law school in July 2023, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and Leilani uh, has a very distinguished career. She is uh, still a, um, a Supreme Court Justice of Samoa. Am I correct about the yes? Yeah. She's not sitting in the Supreme Court right now, but she still holds a warrant to sit on the Supreme Court. And she was sitting during the constitutional crisis in 2021 when there was a series of cases which um, you might be familiar with. So I'm going to hand on, over now to Professor Leilani Tuala Warren. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Myra. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa and talo falava. Warm Pacific greetings to the Honourable Minister Nanaya Mahuta and of course members of the audience. Um, I will speak briefly today about uh, democracy in the Pacific and how I think New Zealand fares in promoting that democracy. And it needs to be acknowledged firstly that um, po political systems of the Pacific Islands were inherited and imported from elsewhere. And despite that though, Pacific Islands have mostly shown a very strong commitment to the maintenance of their inherited democratic institutions. And generally on the whole, Pacific Islands have a good track record uh, of holding regular free and um, fair elections. For example, Tonga uh, held its first election under reformed electoral and constitutional arrangements in November, 2010 after public protests for major constitutional change. And it should be noted that democratic institutions are more than the holding of fair elections, organizing and speaking freely and expressing oneself through the ballot box. Elections and parliaments are the cornerstones of democratic systems, 
but the strength of democracy relies on a broader ecosystem encompassing the media, civil society, education system, and the inclusion of historically underrepresented uh, groups. Inseparable from the operation of democracy is the upholding of professionalism and independence of both the judiciary and the police. Democratic norms and practices have a solid foundation in the Pacific, but recent events are reminders that a proper understanding of the respective roles of the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, and the police cannot be taken for granted in our region. So what are these recent events? In 2022, the Papua New Guinean general election was plagued by delays, issues with the electoral roll, and concerning incidents of violence, resulting in many fatalities and thousands of displayed citizens. Transparency International PNG stated that the election continued the trend of deterioration of the quality of elections in PNG. Now, both Fiji and the Solomon Islands have experienced ethnic conflicts um, culminating in coups and the forcible removal of democratically elected governments. The general election in Fiji in 2022 pitched as a showdown between two former coup leaders, um, Rambuka and Bani Marama, resulted in a hung parliament with the Social Liberal Democratic Party holding the balance of power. And in the aftermath of the election, amid messy negotiations to form coalition government, there were serious concerns that a peaceful transfer of power would not take place. Rambuka accused Banimarama of sowing fear and chaos in an attempt to maintain power. Ultimately, an agreement was reached, and on Christmas Eve, Rambuka was sworn in as the Prime Minister, a significant milestone in Fiji's democratic history. Now, in Kiribati, which withdrew from the Pacific Islands Forum in July 2022, the government attempted to deport one of its High Court justices, David Lamborn, who is also the husband of Kiribati's op opposition leader. In the aftermath, four other senior judges were suspended, and that left the country without an operational High Court. Kiribati's Attorney General was appointed Acting Chief Justice in October 2022, and the New Zealand Law Society argued that this appointment would challenge the independence of the judiciary and the constitution separation of powers that is fundamental to a functioning democracy. In Solomon Islands, the election originally scheduled to be called by May this year is delayed until 2024, with the government claiming it could not afford to host both the Pacific Games and hold an election in the same year. And a member of the opposition and outspoken, outspoken critic of the government labeled it an authoritarian move Extending terms of government it has also been done before in the region, notably in Samoa in the early 1990s. Now, which brings me to Samoa, which has long been touted as the beacon sorry, of democracy and political stability in the Pacific. In 2021, Samoa experienced a deadlock in election results with subsequent efforts to delegitimize the court through allegations of judicial bias and undermine the court's role to interpret the constitution and adjudicate disputes according to the law. While frightening at the time, thankfully due to the judicial branch working as it should in a democracy, Samoa got through its troubles and now has a new government. It did highlight the most essential feature of democracy is that political parties accept their losses. Now the Pacific is the region in which New Zealand matters the most, wields the most influence and has the most impact. And those are words which are used in New Zealand's uh, Pacific Reset, which was launched by the government Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and which has been described as the most significant shift in policy towards the Pacific Island region in decades. The Pacific Redress is to address New Zealand's eroding influence and its ability to pursue its interests in the region. The Pacific Reset is seen as a cultural change for New Zealand, a move towards Pan-Pacific rather than New Zealand-specific approach to issues. It seeks to advance New Zealand's interests through influencing public diplomacy target audiences because it believes publics in the Pacific 
can influence domestic politics in the Pacific. The values cited by MFET diplomats included democracy, human rights, equality, and especially, especially gender equality, governance, transparency, respect for law, and the international rules, uh, fairness, and the notion of environmental guardianship. So the focus of the reset is on a two-way engagement, a term which encompasses dialogue, partnerships, listening, and collaboration, and other characteristics include more non-governmental actors, social media, and a greater connection between the domestic and international. And I believe that this Pacific reset is a move in the right direction. And two focuses of the reset are, reset are especially significant. The first is its focus on connections between domestic New Zealand audiences and audiences in the Pacific as providing another method of promulgating New Zealand values. New Zealand's commitment, for example, to a free press and to democracy are values of the New Zealand Pacific communities. And these communities can promote these values to their families and through their connections to people in the Pacific Island nations. This is significant as around 7% of New Zealanders are Pacifica in origin. A second focus in the, is the incorporation of social media work in the New Zealand Pacific public diplomacy, both from its head office and through each diplomatic post, which has its own Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter feeds. Social media is a powerful tool of engagement and for information and sharing that information to new and hard to reach audiences. And I use Tonga as an example of this. In, tw in 2005, overseas Tongans financially supported the civil servant strike in Tonga, which helped sustain that strike for six weeks. Through the internet, they were able to monitor on a daily basis events in the country and take part in national discourse. In short, overseas Tongans were directly and significantly involved in national affairs, and it'll be virtually impossible to stop them, particularly with the communication revolution brought about by the internet. Tonga's leading news portal, the Matangi Tonga Online, had more than 43 million hits for the year ending 31 May 2006. Unencumbered by space restrictions, the internet allowed Tongans a greater say in national affairs than newspapers. And perhaps the best way to put into practice public diplomacy is to listen to Pacific voices and connect the lessons and insights of these voices heard through engagement to practice. And I applaud New Zealand's Pacific Reset as we need in the Pacific to continue to invest in building the key institutions of democracy and, under and the understanding of the need of each to respect the role of the others. And in short, New Zealand needs to continue to promote universal democratic rights and values, sorry, in the Pacific. And the challenge now, as I see it, is for New Zealand to remain relevant in the face of a rapidly changing Pacific landscape, given the pressure from other countries, which may not share the same democratic values. Relevance has to be fe uh, felt at the coalface that is on the ground in those islands. And New Zealand, I think, has to be congratulated for striking the right balance when it comes to its relationship with its closest neighbors. And perhaps to end off, I was wondering, Honorable Minister, um, what your thoughts were on this reset now that it's been implemented for a few years? Faktai Mayamanuya. Thank you, uh, Professor Tuala Warren. So we are going to move to our second speaker. Uh, so Professor Claire Breen is um, a world-renowned expert on human rights. She holds a PhD from the University of Nottingham, and her main fields of research are human rights law, public international law, international humanitarian law, and international human rights law. Um, her PhD was in the area of child rights, but since then, uh, Claire has branched out enormously and um, is, is a well, really well-published and well-respected author. So without further ado, I will hand over to Claire. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, tofolta, rote, galere. 
Um, thank you, Myra and Al, for organizing this event today. And thank you, Minister, for joining us. Um, I would like to talk about the centrality of the promotion and protection of human rights to the maintenance of international peace and security. So in that way, combining two of my uh, research interests. Um, the importance of human rights in the post-World War II order was signaled um, in 1945 with the adoption of the UN Charter. New Zealand was an active participant then in the drafting process of the Charter. And the Charter opens by setting out some of the aims and purposes of the UN. Amongst those are the maintenance of international peace and security and the promotion and encouragement of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights spelled out what those rights were. In so doing, it made two further points about the importance of human rights in averting conflict and war. And so the declaration tells us that human rights must be protected by the rule of law so as to make sure that people don't have to resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression. It also tells us that freedom, justice and peace in the world are founded on recognizing humanity's inherent dignity and everyone's equal and inalienable rights. And again, New Zealand through Prime Minister Peter Fraser played a strong role in the drafting of the declaration. And it's also worth noting that December 10th this year, marks the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration. Within three years of the adoption of the Declaration, three other key th treaties were adopted to try to mitigate the impact of war upon humanity, the scourge of war, as the UN Charter had described it. So these treaties were the Genocide Convention 1948, the Geneva Conventions from 1949, and the Refugee Convention of 1951. Since the 1960s, um, a compre comprehensive framework of human rights law has developed within the UN. Aotearoa New Zealand has ratified most of the core treaties with the um, exception of the International Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Their Families and the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances. But Despite the earlier links between peace and security and human rights, and despite the fact that much of the treaty law that has developed references this connection between peace, security and human rights, the UN body of human rights law that developed in those decades since the 1960s seems to have followed a bit of a different path. There has been a strong focus on state sovereignty. We see that the actual implementation of rights and state's obligations is, off, is primarily a matter for states themselves. States' efforts in this regard are assessed by a wide range of monitoring and review mechanisms. And this state of affairs reflects one of the major criticisms of the UN's human rights regime, which is its apparent inability to secure a real and significant change. What we see is human rights abuses continuing with state sovereignty often acting as a shield to international intervention, uh, or in some cases, any real meaningful discussion. But in spite of this apparent silo effect, human rights have succeeded in making their presence felt beyond the human rights legal framework and the somewhat narrow array of uh, regular reporting mechanisms. In particular, we can see that about 30 years ago, the Security Council began to formally recognize that gross human rights abuses signaled a descent or could signal a descent into civil war and that civil war was a threat to international peace and security. Not long after that, the promotion and protection of human rights found its way into Security Council debates, resolutions that authorized peace operations that were set up to maintain or restore international peace and security. Aotearoa New Zealand has served on the Security Council on four occasions, starting in 1954 and ending most recently in 2016. New Zealand has also contributed to peace operations, both regionally and further afield, from Korea to Cambodia, Iraq, former Yugoslavia, through to Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands. 
the link between human rights and armed conflict is also established from within the human rights arena within the UN. So the Human Rights Council can investigate alleged human rights abuses within member states, and it has, it has established a number of fact-finding commissions to investigate human rights violations in various conflict zones, uh, such as uh, Libya, Syria, and Ukraine. But the fact that states can uh, engage in gross human rights uh, violations or face allegations of that whilst also being a member of the council is one of the biggest criticisms of this body. In response to that, the observation has been made that no international institution is perfect. Many have serious flaws, but walking away won't fix them. Principled engagement might. And so my question for you, Honourable Minister, is when it comes to human rights and the, international, the maintenance of international peace and security at a global level, what do you think should be Aotearoa and New Zealand's priorities within the next few years? Kiora and Gaurav Mahagat. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, that was excellent. And um, our third and final speaker is Professor uh, Al Gillespie. So most of you will know who Al is. He's a frequent commentator in the media on uh, foreign affairs and basically all things legal, I would say, Al. Al's the author of um, 21 books. So let that sink in. 21 books. That's a lot of uh, a lot of hours, a lot of sweat, a lot of maybe tears. But Al's a, um, a really well-known uh, writer on um, uh, international law, all things international law. So I won't um, speak any longer. I will Defer to Al. Thanks so much, Al, for your comments. Mm -hmm. Nākwe, Minister Mahuta. It's an honour to have you here today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the work of your father, but for what he did, not just for the university, but for the, the law school. It's rare that you can see a seed grow into something that large across the road. <laughs> um, I wonder sometimes when I look back on your tenure as foreign minister, if you'd been told in advance what was going to happen, whether you would have taken it or whether the portfolio of being Minister of Racing might have been more appealing. <laughs> it's certainly, there are times, because I don't think many people understand the flywheel that you are as Foreign Minister, whether you're dealing with defence or trade or human rights or economic security, it all goes through you. But right now, I must admit a degree of somewhat disappointment because it's like season one has just finished. And I don't know what's going to happen in season two. And it's about one of those series on Netflix, which just like builds you up and there's so much excitement happening. And then it's about to stop and we're not sure what's then. But when I look at trade, I see the way that with your help, the evolution of our policy in recent years, our completion of the comprehensive progressive agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the work with the UK, the work with the European Union, this ability to diversify and to make sure all of our eggs are not in one basket is very commendable but for season two minister i ask what 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 happens with the fragmentation of international law when the sanctions start to expand we've done great work with regards to the russian sanctions and iran but how do we could make sure that doesn't expand what do we do with the applications of china and taiwan to the same trade agreement and how do we continue to diversify with what Lani said about the Pacific, I fully agree. Through your stewardship, I believe that the Pacific is much more now on the spotlight than it has been for a long time. Arguably, it's too much in the spotlight now because there was a point where it was almost invisible, but now there's invitations to Washington, there's invitations to Beijing, there's money, there's debt, there's aid. The dance card of the Pacific leaders is full and we watch them so closely to who's dancing with who and who's been snuffed <laughs> by who. But I say in season two, what happens next? Do, do we increase our aid? Do we go from 0.23% to 0.7? Do we work more cooperatively with other countries not in the region about what development looks like? And the one area that I fear, that gray area between police, security, and military was what we see in the Solomons and what we now see in East Timor. What there will happen, I don't know. Your work with China remarkable i'm being honest here it's fantastic what you've done to actually Sorry. it's not the chinese embassy <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the 
to, to manage us in a way that our trade has continued to grow, to avoid the dispute that other countries have got into, but on the other hand, to let our voice be heard on human rights, on regional security, on undue influence. Fantastic. But my question for season two, will our Navy continue to support the Freedom of the Seas initiatives as we have previously? What do we do with regional arms control? And what do we do with human rights concerns that become so significant that when we push them to the UN and we can't get them through the Human Rights Council, what do we do then with so much faith? The balance on defense, excellent again. We've moved closer to NATO. We've renewed relationships with Australia and Japan. And to your credit, a decision was not made on AUKUS, but all the information for the public is now there. And so we can have a full and informed debate about what whether we do or do not join. And so I think this is a progress. People understand the need for defense. There's been a maturity in the way that we see our position, not just in terms of a regional police officer, but also potentially as a military force again, things that we didn't want to think about for such a long time. But in the next season, what do we do with AUKUS? Where do we set the GDP figure on how much we give to defense? And what do we do with Australia? Because our belligerent friends, Australia, does tend to get into fights sometimes with other countries. I think your best work, if I'm honest, was the Ukraine. I think the way that you've managed to stand up with what was an outrageous breach of the United Nations Charter. It was brave to put New Zealand into a non-neutral position. We support them with finance. We support them with the military. We support them at the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. But what's going to happen in season two? What happens next? What does peace look like? I think it's been very easy to support them, but what are we willing to compromise on, if anything? Do we compromise on territory? Do we compromise on war crimes? What do we do if the support from our friends falls away? Do we continue to support the Ukraine? You can watch what's happening overnight, what's happening in, in Congress, mm -hmm. and, and the loss of, or the contestability of foreign aid for the Ukraine. And that, of course, brings you to the biggest second season of all. What happens if Trump gets re-elected in November? And so we're in this point where I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your stewardship through a very difficult part of our global history and representing our country so well. But my question for you is, out of all the foreign policy discussions, what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Thank you very much, Al. So uh, before I hand over to uh, Nanaya to respond, I just want to say that um, when Al set up the uh, structure for this, I think he said each person will get to ask the minister one question. Just want to say, Al, <laughs> I was writing it down and I think there's at least a dozen questions there. So, um, you know, you didn't stick to your own rules, but that's okay. So I'll let, I'll let Nanaya choose which questions she wants to respond to because I don't think there's any way she can respond to all of those questions. They're really great questions, but uh, I think um, we would probably exceed the time limit if we try to answer all of them. But uh, I'll let her pick and choose. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over to you so I don't waste any more of our precious time. Thank you very much, Nanaya. Yeah. Okay. Well, th first of all, Emihiana Kia Tata Katoe, who be my Nati Na Koutou, uh, ki. Uh, Tine uh, wahi rongonui me ki e aki aki e te aki i te hiri kapo me ngā whainga o te mā tauranga i raro i te parirau o te tohu o te nei whariwānanga ko te tangata te mea nui koina. Um, and just a brief acknowledgement of this place and uh, what it does to ensure that the uh, minds uh, of all our people can be nurtured and inspired uh, to pursue and seek knowledge in a way that is for the benefit of the people, which is the tohu of the universe, and that certainly is something that I uh, can connect to, given all our years of experience with this place. Thank you for the opportunity for coming to have a kōrero, and we're all out on the campaign trail, hence the, the uh, sneakers, because <laughs> we've got to, uh, these boots are made for walking, and we've just got to uh, get around and do what we can. 
uh, when Mara asked me to uh, come along and sit and have a bit of a conversation, it was with the understanding this, that this would be as free-flowing and engaging as it possibly could, given that the subject matter uh, was foreign affairs. Just by way of context, uh, when I came into the uh, role as Minister of Foreign Affairs, I'd actually thought I'd made the best case possible uh, to Jacinda around being the Minister for Infrastructure. <laughs> I quickly realised she had other plans. And when she said to me, and I think that uh, you should think about taking on uh, foreign affairs, to which I had no prior knowledge except an interest in the world, I said to her, are you sure? And she said to me, yes, I am sure. And I said, you do know that it would be a very different landscape from the one that I've inherited. And she said, for that reason, but more importantly, the Pacific region is so important to New Zealand. I think you could probably spend quite a bit of effort building our relationship with the Pacific at a time when it is actually really required. Um, so don't leave it to chance. And then there were other th conversations. But just wanted to give you that context because you are not taught how to be a Minister of Foreign <laughs> Affairs. And I don't care what anyone says. People who have come into this portfolio it's uh, know that it's an absolute privilege. But steady as she goes in terms of the ship that we inherit, uh, it is very much based on a long legacy of developing uh, our independent foreign policy, what that means, but also a strong diplomatic footprint that keeps the relationships that we have across the globe quite stable and necessarily so. That said, uh, there, there were a few things I knew instinctively that I could bring to the portfolio that would be a point of difference, and I'll kind of go through this as I answer the questions. One, the relationship element, because if we consider that um, foreign policy uh, is about some key ingredients, like making a cake, uh, it's about architecture, it's about the international rules-based norms, how that reflects itself, how we continue to build confidence in those norms. Uh, it's about also uh, ensuring that we continue to be, a, a, as a small country, I believe, a strong contributor to the international community and our multilateral effort. Uh, therefore, relationships matter. So those are some key ingredients that I think, I don't know what the academics say, <laughs> but that, I think those are key ingredients to understand the nature of the tasks that you've inherited as you uh, steward this kind of a portfolio through. And if relationships do matter, we have to understand context in place. Uh, context is that we are a small country that is often looked to by the global community in a way where we are seen to hold a level of integrity in the way that we uh, conduct ourselves within the international community. And we do that because we're a small country, we're reliant on the relationships, our multilateral kind of stance generally. The fact that we have stood and voiced our concerns on really important issues that are have been defined by our region, like our nuclear-free stance. We're the only country that has a ministerial portfolio that is completely designated for a minister of disarmament. And that in itself sends a signal to the world that we take these issues seriously. It's not lip service. We convey a spirit of belief that nuclear arms in our world is actually not our future. And so I feel that that's something really quite important. The other element that we have continued to, um, to highlight, and probably more in a contemporary context, is climate change as the existential challenge for our region, which has only been amplified uh, by Pacific states. And we join that voice, and we know that that is more and more continuing to shape uh, how people perceive New Zealand and uh, perhaps our uh, ability to lead out in, in certain aspects. And then as a small country, we have been a quick and earlier adopter of uh, free trade agreements. And that's evolved over time. Uh, being the first country to reach a free trade agreement with China, for example, in 2008, I was Minister of Customs at the time and uh, was responsible for all the background functions and getting over to China to figure out how we're going to make it practically work for our export community. But long story short, is we embraced free trade in a way that we've continued to evolve progressive trade agreements that have greater cognizance of environmental benefits, mm -hmm. greater cognizance of the new economy space um, and digital economy partnerships and the like, and greater cognizance that if we're doing free trade 
in a way that matters for the future, then we have to have a greater emphasis on the benefits to small to medium enterprises and that ecosystem, because in many of the countries that we want to have trade agreements with, uh, women are actually the backbone of the economy. So women in, in enterprise does matter. An interesting and helpful fact, which might in part answer some of your questions about the trade context. In terms of our um, export platform, 70% of our trade agreements cover uh, the pretty much what, what offerings we have across the globe. And then there's 30% that we have a um, TBC or TBA kind of approach to India. India doesn't want a free trade agreement with New Zealand and therefore we have to find other ways to provide and extract value between the relationship. And it could be a sector by sector approach with India, which they're quite open to. And, it, and our entry point with India may well be by way of direct business to business relationships enabled by government. So that's a conversation space that we're in now. The GCC, um, we stalled because of relationships and primarily with Saudi Arabia, um, but that is an area now that is currently under discussion and we are trying to accelerate uh, the potential for an opportunity to reach an agreement with the GCC through the United Arab Emirates who are very keen for a bilateral relationship uh, with New Zealand, probably for broader reasons than actual mm -hmm. trade. But the point of it is, if we can use that as an accelerant to push the GCC arrangements ahead, uh, that's great. And then there are smaller, uh, other bespoke uh, types of arrangements. My point being that we are, uh, as a small nation, being very proactive in the trade space, we um, should be proud of what we have achieved. Um, but importantly, we should now use trade as an opportunity to get cut through in the areas where we have many concerns um, and human rights is one of them, actually. And we can figure out how do we have these conversations because, for example, with the African Union, um, and a very interesting set of relationships going forward, but a really important set of challenges uh, when it comes to uh, human rights and, um, you know, stable and cohesive uh, society um, and, and institutions. The um, Pacific relationship, this is re a really important piece as I alluded to that I have focused a lot of effort on. Um, you have to remember that the first probably 15 to 18 months of my tenure, we had COVID and lockdowns and I it had occurred to me having done a whole heap of Zoom meetings and bilaterals that I could well be the first foreign minister <laughs> that would never travel <laughs> and I was starting to get quite nervous about that because people often criticise the amount of effort you put into people to people connections and diplomacy um, at that level but what I can say is at a ministerial level when you are meeting with your counterpart in person you can cut through a lot of guff um, and that's from from our often our um, advisors about what are the things that you should say but we are not in tick, um, tick box uh, diplomacy anymore because the issues are too complex and too challenging we need to get to some pretty direct conversations very quickly and that's why sitting across the table from someone so that they get the measure of you and what matters to you and your country the things that you're trying to achieve um, can often leapfrog probably a whole heap of paperwork that takes months and months to put together to provide you with advice to get you probably only a half a step away. So I'm a, I am I, I had to learn how to get to the best diplomatic um, mode that I could for New Zealand. And actually, people are people everywhere. They, they like straight talking. They might not <laughs> like what you say, um, but to characterise some of the most complex relationships uh, that we have and, and uh, they have been commented on, if we're uh, consistent, predictable and respectful and we get all the hard issues out of the way and we say it face to face before we say it out in public, often, while it's not liked, it's understood. While it's not liked, it's understood. And I, in, in, in our most complex relationships with larger uh, partners and, and actors, that's definitely uh, the approach that I've taken. Um, what that means is that uh, on issues like human rights, we don't have to recoil uh, from our view on some of the most challenging um, 
issues in the human rights space and China has been the area where we've highlighted um, uh, these particular issues at a time when um, there, there was a very much uh, globally, there, there were, it was a challenge space to think about China and, and how do you manage the relationship. Uh, having been as consistent as we have been, uh, many um, of our um, traditional partners and those who are strong multilateralists have come and sought out New Zealand's approach um, and perhaps without putting too fine a point on it, and I, and I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but it was when I heard um, uh, up in the EU von der Leyen's speech around decoupling, uh, the, the challenge for uh, the European Union is to de-risk, not decouple in terms of its relationship with China and what flowed from that from the European states was exactly that kind of approach um, so that they could manage this complex relationship with China. In a way, it mirrored where we had got to. Um, I uh, Coming back to the Pacific, China has been a player, uh, a long-term player uh, in the region. And sometimes I think we underestimate now the whakapapa connections across the Pacific that have integrated with uh, the Chinese population, which is not necessarily the CCP. So we have to kind of be a bit sensitive to that. But in being sensitive to that, uh, Pacific states are trying to themselves uh, figure out how do we manage the strategic composition, uh, the competition in our region between China and the US, but also other development partners who are crowding into the Pacific, mm -hmm. making the dance card very full, to use your term now. Um, and so where we have arrived at is... Actually, if we as members of the Pacific start to voice out that the centrality of the Pacific, it rests on strengthening the Pacific Island Forum, uh, which is re that, the regional architecture, uh, rests on uh, ensuring that in no uncertain terms, climate change is the existential threat that we need greater engagement on. And there are priorities that fall from that that have been expressed in the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific. That is a really significant step forward. But then there are other things that New Zealand could do to lean into how we support the resilience of the Pacific. So the question to me was, what do I think about the reset? Well, the reset was a set of aspirations, which have rightly identified in your presentation, Leilani, all the um, expectations that, uh, that we would have uh, in terms of engaging in this certain in this way, so I inherited the reset and said, well, actually, with climate change being the issue, we have to move from reset to resilience. We have to fund the way in which our domestic resp um, response underpins how we work with the Pacific. So, for example, um, while we had uh, a nat um, natural disaster response underpinned by the defence force. Um, activities that we undertook uh, in terms of um, strengthening democracy and the role of our electoral commission and being uh, independent observers, um, our development uh, aid, which was pretty much project-based, um, we had to rethink all of that. And in rethinking all of that, I basically suggested that we needed a whole-of-government approach and we needed to fund the capacity of that approach in order to bring together um, a different way of working with the Pacific, taking a Pacific partner-led approach, uh, ensuring that we could um, take a more programmatic uh, uh, approach to funding so that the Pacific was starting to lead the conversation around what were its challenges. Take climate change, for example. Uh, the challenge for much of the Pacific is to have the cap technical capability to bring together its objectives in order to guide uh, development partners and the way in which they were funding into this particular space. Also, uh, lead, uh, regulatory uh, mechanisms. So we kind of try to help, at least in our bi bilateral uh, relationship, fund into that space to be able to provide greater strategic investment so that it could guide um, other activities. And I can, I can come back to that. I think it's a good thing to do because what we were experiencing and hearing from the Pacific was that there's a whole heap of funding out there, mm. but actually for, for small Pacific states to access that funding and the level of administrative burden 
and the um, limited technical capability, it would be three or five years before you'd even see the light of day on any funding coming into the Pacific. So what we've provided is an accelerated uh, opportunity to, again, set strategic priorities, but also uh, be a lot more coordinated in the way that funding can come into the Pacific. And now, partners of the Blue Pacific, like France, like Korea, like Germany, uh, like uh, the US, uh, have all and others have all now started to um, converge and say, we need to figure out how we uh, are more strategic in the way that we partner and fund projects, significantly infrastructure projects, which only really had one funder, which indebted the Pacific and that was China. Mm. Uh, and so this is a positive um, uh, migration of effort, if you like, um, in the way that, um, things are moving towards Pacific lead aspirations. The last thing I would say, um, not not to finish on the Pacific because everything begins and ends there, but I, I, I had to ask myself, okay, if we were working really well in the Pacific across a number of domains, strengthening the bureaucracy through our Pacific Fale, um, strengthening democratic institutions through a, a layered level of interactions, strengthening our support, and the judicial system through various ways, you know, how would that uh, create, um, I guess, credence with the Pacific about the value of the New Zealand relationship? So I've expressed to MFED officials, you know, basically Pacific would refer to us as uh, trusted partners of first preference. Now they might not say those words, but if they point to the kinds of ways of working and examples where this is really what we want more of, mm -hmm. then I think that is a demonstration of the value of the relationship, but the value of our effort to do something different in response to the to the Pacific. Um, so much in in what uh, our what you were asking me, I I don't know, I don't know all the answers on, <laughs> on all the questions you were asking me. And if this is part one, you know, what did I learn? I was up in uh, Paris uh, for the Paris uh, Indo-Pacific Summit the two days before Russia invaded the Ukraine. And it was the most curious time to be up there because we were at a summit for the Pacific <laughs> mm. um, and the European unions were in and out of the summit. And I asked, um, I asked the minister, foreign minister for Germany, I said, oh, you guys are in and out. I don't know if we're getting good value out of this particular <laughs> meeting. She goes, well, we're, everything's all about Ukraine. I said, no, I, I absolutely get that, and I, I appreciate that. And I said, well, what's the thinking? What's the mindset? And she said, well, you know, obviously we're all of one mind because we'd had the conversation about the infringement of territorial integrity and sovereignty, and we couldn't let uh, Russia's invasion um, go um, without swift action. And she said, well, what we're discussing amongst the European Union um, uh, states as uh, swift economic sanctions. And that immediately made me think, actually, New Zealand had, we, we didn't have a sanctions act. Mm -hmm. And so in the time frame it took for me to get back from Paris to New Zealand, having had a number of calls with the, uh, the Prime Minister and our relevant cabinet colleagues, we, all, we, we were of a mind that we needed to stand up a sanctions act, the Russia Sanctions Act, um, very quickly so that we could act in unison and in step uh, with uh, other um, partners, other members of the international community. And we did that. Would I do it again like that? No, I've got lots of learning. <laughs> <laughs> but no, because I understand the importance of, you know, um, th these things in, in, in the process. But actually the time necessitated it. So you don't start from a place of perfection every time. Was it the right thing to do? Absolutely it was. And have we been seen to take actions across the um, trade and economic sanctions, travel bans, um, humanitarian aid, um, being able to provide training, supporting the ICC, um, ICJ kind of avenues? It's been all seen in, in total as a really, um, uh, uh, actually, it's a valued contribution. It, it's not so much as how much as it is. As, 
about the breadth of support that we're able to offer Ukraine to defend itself. So I think we should be, feel quite proud of that. It's credible and it's it's mm -hmm. it's valued. The challenge right now in terms of the conversation space with uh, Russia and Ukraine, given the global impact uh, that it's having, is the end game. That's the conversation space. Is, is there the prospect of the end game? So, of course, countries like New Zealand would use its influence to say in both my meetings and the Prime Minister's meeting to China, anything you can do to use your influence to bring this to an end really does matter. Uh, however, uh, in order to return to uh, to a opportunity where um, negotiation can truly take place, Ukraine must agree. You know, and you know, returning um, uh, back to uh, territorial borders, internationally agreed territorial borders, um, uh, stopping uh, current uh, warfare and aggression uh, within the Ukraine and ensuring that the commencement of peaceful negotiations has the agreement with Ukraine is a starting point. It's not the end point because everybody, you know, Zelensky's got a peace process. China had a peace process. I understand from the BRICS meeting, there was some conversation mm -hmm. there about a mm -hmm. peace process. Um, so we use our influence to implore um, those who have the greatest influence on Russia to use it. Sadly, uh, the end game looks very dim, um, and this then brings into question how long can, can the international community sustain its support for the Ukraine, uh, and I, it's a live question, and you rightly point out the challenges with Congress and getting budgets over the line, and I understand from the US um, there was an idea that there would be a separate budgetary consideration for Ukraine, mm -hmm. given that Biden couldn't get it through in the 45-day decision that was made just recently. So, you know, it's all a challenge. It's all a challenging um, situation. What keeps me up at night? Warfare's definitely changed. Um, our regional peace and security um, previously was predicated on the size of our defence force. This comes to the two percent, um, you know, two percent arbitrary target of um, of what is considered internationally as a credible um, investment in your uh, defence capacity. I think for New Zealand, given our remoteness and the way that we've got to work, we've got to think about uh, security, defence, and resilience all as a group, and we need to, we also need to figure out. Uh, with our Pacific partners and with Australia and those who are looking at our region, what what can we do best together? What can we best can we do together? Uh, strategically, our region is is an important region, but we don't have the population um, or the level of investment in pure defence capability, perhaps for for us ourselves to feel. Um, that that is our sole way of guarding our security. I'll say it like that. I think there are other ways that we can guard our security. Um, so to give you a sense of perhaps the conversations that might continue to mature and um, grow over this period of time, our maritime space is really important for us. Uh, and therefore, what we do in our maritime space um, becomes quite important. That might head, in, head to your comment now about in the future, as we gain more information, would we ever become a part of it? Because right now, it doesn't serve our needs. Um, there are pillar two elements to the caucus arrangements that we still don't have full visibility over, but we're seeking out more information. What does it mean? But what we offer our region is an understanding of our region. And warfare is becoming very different. It's very much intelligence-led technology. It's precise. Urban warfare will become more of a reality than not, whereas our traditional warfare approach has been kind of you know, in the big open fields and things like that. It'll be very, very precise. Um, and those types of things keep me up at night. So it's cy cyber and AI, actually, the impact of cyber and AI on our peace and security, because it's, it's, so, it's moving so rapidly. I think about this. 
in we went to watch a movie last night the create the creator <laughs> the mind boggles with AI um but it's that um that keeps me up at night in a not so healthy way the thing that keeps me sane and still optimistic about this job is a common belief in humanity it's a common belief in humanity I think if we were to again have a really open and honest conversation across the table from uh, to, to figure out where we build bridges and ensure that our, our diplomatic dialogue remains open, it must for New Zealand. We can't, we don't have the privilege of saying, oh, we're out of here. Mm. We have to maintain our diplomatic channels. They must always be open. Fundamental faith in humanity and the fact that we do not want war on a global scale where we have to worry about our existence and livelihood. And I just feel the flavour of the of Unga and the country um, presentations that were provided. That was an overwhelming theme of messages coming through from every participant in, at the UN. And it was my privilege to be able to offer our country's um, statement because it really amplified to me um, how important the UN is. One thing, though, New Zealand has to hold fast to what we always believe um, uh, around the um, P5 right of faith veto. It has no, it, it should have no value anymore if a P5 country can take an action that is so contrary to the UN Charter. You know, and my understanding is that that is something when Fraser, Fraser signed, signed yeah. up, you know, that, 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 that the concept of a P5, and I'd be happy to be educated on this, but my understanding was that at the time, the politics of the day was that it was a temporary uh, set, uh, kind of set of arrangements, but it's certainly been eclipsed. We certainly don't need it anymore. And, we, and interestingly enough, when I attended the Security Council meeting just in this visit, Zelensky said if the if the Security Council was going to truly represent uh, all nations, large and small, why would you have a right of veto? Why would you? Um, and I think he left quite an impression on many of those who were listening um, to really think about accelerating reform of the UN. Don't accept that it's a huge beast that takes so long to reform. Mm -hmm. So I think taking a reformist agenda to the UN will be important in the next Secretary General, should she be... <laughs> so I'm manifesting here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should, should she be um, able to uh, do that, uh, I, I certainly would be one that would welcome her, um, um, her energy around that. So... I've, I've perhaps not answered nearly enough of the questions, but you've got a flavour of how I'm thinking about things. Mm -hmm. um, part two, um, I would hope, um, and I would say this, Labour has not held the foreign affairs uh, portfolio for a number of years, so this has been the first time since Phil Goff, mm -hmm. um, and therefore the muscle memory of international relations and foreign affairs policy, just at a party level, uh, while while it remains ambitious, the ability to give effect to a real uh, labour kind of um, flavour to foreign policy has not really been there. So I feel that I've, you know, made some inroads, but there's so much more to do. And I feel that our International Relations Committee um, that um, have been working hard to ensure that our manifesto now captures back some muscle memory and, and builds some muscle memory in this space is very progressive and I, I feel optimistic about that. I hope, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, I think I can say that that was outstanding. Uh, thank you very much. I think, um, well, I got more than I bargained for, so thank you very much. That was a really, really interesting address. I've got pages of notes to look back on and, and reflect on. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us in such an honest and frank way and um, making so many really important points. We don't have a lot of time left. We've sort of run over by um, five minutes. Maybe we could do one or two questions, just one or two sort of quick questions, and then we'll have to wrap because the time was supposed to finish at 1.30, and I, I don't want someone kicking us out of the room, Al, you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, we'll just do a couple of quick questions. Yep. yep. Uh, no, 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 it's all good. <laughs> uh, I, I believe it's really important to be able to have Indigenous voices um, in international forums. Um, do you have any insights about how it's possible to do that? 
Well, I, I mean, part of the um, uh, value that I brought um, alongside building the relationship with the Pacific is trying to ingest a perspective that New Zealand's foreign policy uh, could provide an Indigenous lens that could help uh, address some issues all the world around have been that have been challenging colonisation. Now we can have a conversation on the African Union around colonisation in a way that we're not saying we got it all right, not, and we never should, but we have had a journey of trying to reconcile the impact of colonisation while building a nation, creating some institutions and some ways forward that could look at truth and reconciliation. Um, and restoration and cultural revitalization and economic inclusion that could be really useful to other countries. So I've kind of very much tried to provide a more of a context and a roadmap rather than this is how you do it kind of conversation. And when I think about, you know, Chile and the lost, um, well, the biggest challenge there is truth and reconciliation, but the lost opportunity of economic participation of Indigenous peoples in their economy, I think, is kind of where, again, we're in a really unique space to try and offer some ways of doing things there. Um, but I, I, I acknowledge that every country context is very different. So I figured with Samoa hosting Chogham um, next year, I thought that that, without indigenising it, what we could do is figure out if the Pacific had kind of a common approach to expressing how de democracy works within the Pacific context and strengthening um, your institutions to, you know, express um, democratic norms with this Polynesian, what will this Pacific cultural context? Um, that would be a good thing. And uh, that, that, in my mind, could create another kind of bridge for New Zealand to come in and say, and within that context, you know, this is how Indigenous issues work. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit more organic in my mind, and it requires a lot of politics and a lot of talking to kind of get there. But that's why I thought it's very, very useful for Samoa to host Chogham next year because when um, then Pr Prince Charles, but now King Charles, presented in um, Rwanda and he gave the opening address, he said he accepts that in order for the Commonwealth to be relevant, and I'm slightly paraphrasing, in order for the Commonwealth to be relevant, it needs to move through some of the most hurtful aspects of its past, like slavery. And then by extension, colonisation kind of, you know, you look across her and say that. And I thought for someone who was going to inherit the monarchy to say that about the Commonwealth, I thought that was really insightful because he recognises the Commonwealth is a growing institution. It's not diminishing in its membership. So therefore he, I think, gave a signal and almost agency that we need to have these conversations in a positive way. So I took a lot of hope from those comments and that's why I'm really kind of looking forward to the um, Pacific hosted um, Chogham event. I think mm -hmm. that's going to be quite exciting actually. Mm -hmm. mm. That's great, thank you. Do we have one more question? Anybody? Max? My great fear is that we have not addressed the greatest uh, invasion that is going to come in the very near future. And I have known about this from about 1970 when the FBI died. There was no bio work for CIA, but he was a teacher of math and physics. And he had a PhD. He'd done all the study on the global warming. Mm. My master's is in earth science, and it's basically a post of the book. I think we're staring down the barrel of thousands of incredibly rich people buying a shower in a temple climate, coming here and buying property. And localizing, putting their families here, they wouldn't be doing that. And going back to one year, political businesses and to help the population there. So we could be overrun from five million to ten million overnight. And our treaty wiping principles and all the rest of it will be swamped with these people coming in from semi totalitarian institutions. And I believe when the plates 
we're actually a guard for the next five years, and the sea level comes up, they're going to hit the this button at a cut. So what's the plan mm -hmm. for us to avoid the inundation of these very rich people coming into this country and pointing out communities? Were you asking me about um, immigration policy? And that it, this is probably one of the challenging um, conversations, most challenging I've ever experienced as a member of parliament since I've gone into politics because yeah. there, are, there are big divergent views around um, the role of immigration to, to accelerate and enhance your economic um, growth or to support um, economic opportunity elsewhere through uh, labour migration into New Zealand for a period of time and the like. And then there's our refugee commitments, our human, you know, humanitarian commitments. So I, I suspect we are going to have very different flavours of conversation in the immigration space that are climate that are going to be climate informed. Um, and we're not there yet, but I feel we are close because these are the kinds of conversations that have been driven from within the Pacific, for example, when you've got the real prospect of Kiribati, Tuvalu, you know, and sea level rise and mm. displacement being a very real uh, factor. So that might be a counterbalance to some of the challenges you're outlining in terms of um, uh, immigrant immigration uh, having a negative impact on our own population. So I don't have an answer for you, but we are better served when we have that when we have the fullness of a conversation. I should I should actually add one of the things I've also done since being a um, uh, minister of foreign affairs is try to cultivate within the ministry by the way that they behave but also by the way that I engage and bring in my international um, ministerial colleagues is more and more foreign policy requires social license and we have to um, figure out because we have to explain why are we spending all this money in Ukraine and not domestically why are we uh, not why are we um, signing up to these international treaties but domestically there's no congruence and things like that so what I've learned, and I have to say, this is why this is part one, not part two. Part two will be much better because I've learned along the way. But what I've learned is that if you can um, bring bring the um, the public conversation and the social license into the way in which you're undertaking um, uh, policy, um, long term, that's probably going to put you in good stead. Because we cannot have in the foreign affairs space policy that looks and feels and sounds good and upholds all our international obligations, but we are getting more pressure domestically around the why. Mm. So I think that's something to work on for whoever has this role next time around. Mm. Okay. On that note, uh, whoever has this role in the next uh, in the next round, I think is a really good place to uh, to end. I personally hope that you have uh, this role in the next round, and uh, and I think a lot of people in this room feel the same way that we would like you to have the second round as well to finish the work you've started. Uh, so, yep, yeah, it's that time of the year. Um, <laughs> so, without turning this into an overtly political situation, don't forget to vote. And yeah. if you and if you make your decision, vote early. And if you're not decided, come talk to me. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nanaya, for coming and spending your time with us. I'm really grateful. Uh, that's, um, you know, I've said it before, but I just want to say it again. I know you you added us in at the end of a really busy mm -hmm. travel period and you could be doing uh, different things. So thank you for choosing us today and sharing some of your experiences with us. Mm -hmm. Okay.